All right, I show about 631. Uh, probably just go ahead and get started here. Uh, again, this is, uh, I'm Todd Shea with the National Weather Service in La Crosse. Um, the warning coordination meteorologist, uh, been at the office since 1995 and in the agency now going on 32 years since 1988. Uh, appreciate you spending the time this evening to attend what is now our third Weather Explorer series talk. Uh, we did a talk earlier this summer on lightning and then another one on flash flooding. And uh, based on a suggestion from uh, from one of our viewers, uh, thought it would be interesting to hear about fog. I, I like the idea, especially this time of year when when fog is uh, uh, more prevalent in our area and, and certainly can be uh, become dangerous. So we're gonna talk about that. Uh, this presentation will probably only go about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, we probably won't need up the whole hour by any means. Uh, I am doing this from home. Uh, a lot of us are still teleworking, but we always have people at the office, of course. It just kind of depends on, on how busy the weather is, that sort of thing. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and we're just gonna kind of dive in, talk about a subject where we uh, uh, we see a lot of, uh, before I, I continue, again, if you've got any questions, you can use the, the question options there that, that kind of go with the GoToWebinar interface and in usually in the upper right. Uh, as I'm speaking or if I'm in the middle of a subject, I might not get to your question right away, but um, I certainly can answer all the questions before the, the end of the night is uh, here. So, all right. Well, let's dive in here. Let's see here. All right. So it gets us back, I guess, to, uh, to kind of what is what is fog? Uh, how do we define fog? And, you know, if you go on the Internet, you see things like this, a, a visible aerosol consisting of, uh, of tiny water droplets uh, suspended uh, near the Earth's surface or in the air, of course. And so it, it, you think about it, it's just tiny water droplets, uh, almost aerosol, uh, very small that, that gets suspended, but then can also be easily moved around, you know, with wind and things like that. So easy definition. It's a cloud on or near the ground. And um, as you'll you'll hear about as we go through this, it's fog is definitely influenced by bodies of water, you know, how much moisture is around wind conditions, uh, and even topography. They're all big factors in whether fog is going to uh, uh, to form or not. So we'll get we'll get into that certainly with more detail. So I, I think we all kind of know what fog is, you know, it's uh, limits re, uh, visibility. Uh, we're most concerned with fog in, in the forecast business when it gets below a mile, let's say, but certainly when it gets under a half mile and, and that, that zero visibility or quarter mile visibility uh, can get pretty dangerous and, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but fog comes in different forms as well. And, you know, sometimes it actually, it can be quite beautiful depending on your, your view of it, whether it be from an airplane or, you know, a higher terrain location uh, versus the, the average driving location. It's kind of interesting too, uh, in doing some of the preparation for this talk, uh, maybe I didn't study history good enough back in school, but uh, during the Revolutionary War, there was a significant battle that took place on Long Island, uh, Manhattan in New York areas. And really the, uh, George Washington and his army was able to escape that, that uh, siege, if you will, uh, through the cloak of fog. Uh, so fog actually in some way Kind of change the the path of history for our country, and you know who knows what uh, if you know certain battles go certain ways. But so if if you look back at fog history, uh, the Battle of Long Island was a case where fog actually actually helped out. So as we go through the, and talk about you know, fog, you know we we also we hit the definition of it, but uh, it almost always comes down to a, a cooling condition, light winds, and enough moisture to cause that cloud near the ground level to form or, you know, in whatever area. Uh, so we'll talk about the types of fog next, but it's always going to kind of come down to these things, the cooling options, lighter winds, and, you know, having enough moisture. So here's a look, kind of a graphic of the different types of fog. Uh, some fog is um, a little more relevant or a little more uh, happens with frequency, I'm trying to say, uh, versus others. And, and it also depends on what part of the country you're in. Uh, in our area here in the upper Midwest, of course, radiation fog and valley fog are probably the most uh, likely to occur, followed by maybe some advection fog. And again, we're going to talk about uh, 
some of these types. And, and again, there's there's a lot of different ways that you can get a cloud to form near the ground or along a mountain, but these are kind of the main parts. And so let's just kind of hit on some of these basics. So probably one of the most common ways that fog forms or a type of fog is called radiation fog. And, and this is simply, you got cooler air near the ground level, uh, enough low level moisture, you know, maybe maybe it just recently rained or the, the vegetation is damp, that sort of thing. And you have light wind. And uh, a lot of times this will happen after a soaking rain or uh, sometimes it's, it's kind of rainy and cloudy during the day. And if the clouds clear in the evening, it, it, it kind of sets up this uh, this this weather uh, pattern where it's the low level or near the ground, I should say, is very moist and the relative humidity is very high already because you were cloudy all day. But then that clears off and the cool air starts to settle in and fog can form. So we kind of have a saying, you know, in our office, if it's if it turns sunny by dark, you know, in other words, if the clouds clear late in the day, um, you know, some, a lot of times that can lead to fog. So here's a here's a typical image of a radiation fog event. You know, we're just kind of widespread fog, uh, not too deep. It, it can be deep sometimes, depending on the time of year, uh, but not really favoring in one particular area. It's just covering the whole region. And again, that's can usually be the more widespread fog and, and pretty common under certain weather setups. So another fairly popular fog that we see a lot of in in our particular area especially as you get closer to the Mississippi River and a lot of the rivers and tributaries in the region is is of course valley fog and uh, this is similar in some ways to the radiation fog we just talked about in a sense that we have cooler air sinking but in this case the cooler air is sinking into the valleys and um, so it, it, that's where it kind of saturates and the fog forms first again typically light wind and you do need low level moisture, but I will say sometimes it can be very isolated with valley fog. And sometimes the warm water temperatures and some of the nearby rivers can also help lead to the fog. And so um, sometimes you don't need as much low level moisture as you might with a radiation fog event. Uh, so again, this typically happens as nights get longer and, and we look for winds that are relatively light. Uh, the bottom right image you see is uh, is from our webcam at our office. And our office, the National Weather Service La Crosse, is located up on a, on a bluff. And so we can overlook the valley. And this is a, a really strong valley fog night. The, the, the fog almost just kind of fills the entire valley. So we got several examples here, several pictures. Here again, here's you can see some of the, the, the valley tops. This picture was taken from southwest Wisconsin in the Kickapoo River Valley, but it's a classic one of those where the fog kind of hugs the valleys. Here's another shot where you can, again, see the terrain over the fog. But it's, again, where the, the cool air is kind of sinking into the valleys, and that saturates the, uh, the air quicker, and you end up with that fog. And another screenshot from our office, this was taken this past weekend during the morning hours, uh, overlooking the city of La Crosse and into what is the Root River Valley in Houston County, Minnesota. And you can see how the fog had just kind of formed in that particular uh, valley. So valley fog is, is pretty common uh, in the late summer and fall months around the region here. And in a few slides, we're gonna talk about fog climatology and you can really see it when you start looking at the data a little closer. So since we do get a lot of valley fog, I did wanna share a few other images. This was a, a photo taken, someone that was on an airplane uh, kind of leaving the La Crosse area, but you can see in a morning shot, all the fog kind of hugging the valley there. And then, Again, some of the satellite views. So, you know, the previous photo here is taken from a, a plane or, you know, sometimes drone photography can get shots like that. But then we even have the capability of, you know, watching this using satellites. And so the upper right picture you see here is, is kind of showing you all the creeks and streams uh, here in western Wisconsin, southeast Minnesota, northeast Iowa. And then the satellite view on a, on a, on a valley fog morning. And it almost, you know, all these gray or white areas uh, along the black background here on satellite kind of shows you how the fog has kind of filled up all those valleys, almost like veins uh, flowing through here. And then a few other shots from uh, years past. Here's a really classic example of our fog in our area. Uh, again, Rochester, Minnesota is kind of in this area. Uh, La Crosse is, is kind of in this vicinity. 
Eau Claire, Wisconsin, up in this vicinity. So again, you can see the Mississippi uh, River Basin, the La Crosse River, the Wisconsin River, and, and uh, the Turkey Volga Rivers, and so on and so on. How fog in the morning hours uh, just kind of fills in this these areas. And one last satellite view, just to kind of show you this. Here's another one from our area, but it's not just common here. Here's a the shot on the right is an example from Pennsylvania, New York, uh, you know, out in the Northeast on a just a quiet, calm morning. And you can see all the valley fog kind of popping up. It, like, it, it kind of looks like uh, veins or, or little branches breaking off there. All right, so those are probably the most common types of fog that we see, but let's talk about uh, you know a few other types here, um, starting with what we call advection fog. So this is a little different process, but in this process, we are bringing warmer, moist air passing over cooler surfaces uh, that can occur with clouds around, unlike the other fog we talked about, and during windy conditions. In fact, a lot of times it's the wind that is what we call advecting or bringing in uh, warmer or moist air that leads to this fog. So, you know, this type of fog might be more common uh, near large bodies of water, like the photo in the middle here is is taken from uh, the Chicago area and Lake Michigan. Uh, sometimes, you know, of course, San Francisco is known as a, as a foggy area, uh, but it, it can also happen when warmer air is, is passing over existing snow cover. So sometimes even in the middle of winter or in the spring when the, the snow is beginning to to melt, we get our first pit pushes of warm air. We can almost always expect a few of these, what we call advection fog uh, scenarios where it, it's kind of a warm wind for late winter and all that warm air is blowing over the snow cover and it's cooling the, the temperature near that snow so much that it's literally forming fog. Uh, so here's a, is a photo, you can see the, the snow on the sides of the road on this particular shot and then the, the nearby grass and fields. So warm air again coming in and it just kind of, it, it saturates because it's introducing moisture and trying to melt the snow. And the ground is so cold that it just leads to, to pretty shallow fog usually, but uh, can certainly become a problem. All right, let's talk about a few other types, maybe not as quite as uh, common in this area. Uh, the next one's called upslope fog. This is basically where your the warm air is forced upward and then it cools or condenses. Uh, in this case, wind again is oftentimes needed, but the wind direction can make a difference. It can matter if the wind is blowing that that warm moist air up a hill or, or the air up a hill, then it it saturates and it forms a cloud. So depending on the wind direction, it can either dissipate this or or create a lot of upslope fog. And again, this is pretty common in in, in terrain areas and, and mountain areas. Here's another shot. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll see this in the bluffs around our area here where uh, air will be coming up through the bluffs and you'll see uh, patchy clouds or, or little um, ground fog form. That's called upslope fog. And the last type of fog we're gonna talk about here this evening is what's called steam fog. And this is when you have sharply colder air going over warm water. So it might be early in the winter, the, the water temperatures are still relatively warm. Uh, and in, this is another case where you do need the wind. You need to be, again, bringing in that colder air over a warmer surface. Uh, so this is common over bodies of water. It could be lakes, uh, you know, the Great Lakes when that first Arctic cold push comes out, or uh, maybe it's just Arctic air that's going over open waters and that will form a fog. Here's another um, photo of, of one of those examples. Again, cold air going over some open water and you get this uh, fog. And it doesn't have to be winter, you know, it could be just, uh, you know, temperatures in the 40s over uh, 60 degree river water or something like that. And it'll it'll cause some steam fog like that. So, you know, not as common, but but certainly occurs in the area. So those are the different types of fog. And when you talk about, you know, kind of uh, getting into our climatology of where does fog occur most of the time, uh, here's a national photo. You know, you get different types of fog are maybe more frequent in, in different regions, certainly along the coasts and in the high terrain areas, uh, especially the Appalachians and out west. You get a lot of upslope. You can get advection fog. Uh, sometimes even there's enough upslope, even though the, the ground is relatively flat in the central plains, uh, it still rises in elevation. And so if the air is coming in a certain way, it can actually lead to some some pretty foggy conditions. 
Um, but, you know, typically the water areas, uh, uh, Gulf Coast, uh, along our coast, coast usually when we get the, the most. All right, so when we look at specific sites in our particular area at climatology, uh, the way you would look at these graphics is the brighter the colors, let's say you get into the greens or the yellow colors, would be more frequent fog. And the darker the, the blue or purple or even the white pixels mean uh, there's hardly any uh, weather observations of fog. So this was 1980 to 2020 uh, fog reports at uh, Rochester. And you've got time of the day across the, uh, the graph here. And then by day of the year, going from left to right on the screen. And so one of the things you see here is, you know, uh, if you look at the, the time of day from midnight starts on the bottom, uh, and then you go 4 a.m., 8 a.m., and then noon is kind of halfway up the graph, that most of our fog reports, and it makes sense, occur in the morning. That's when everything is cooled down. Uh, everything is kind of saturated in the fog forms. Uh, but so you kind of see a fairly steady signal uh, during the colder months, would be, which would be on the very left part of this diagram and the right. Uh, you see a little bit more of a mixed signal any time of day. And that's, again, because of the snow. Um, it could be advection fog in the area. But you definitely see that morning kind of curve throughout the year. Now, just to look at areas like northern Iowa, Mesa City area, maybe not quite as strong a signal. But again, you have kind of a, a consistent, steady signal during the morning hours, anywhere from 6 a.m. to maybe 9 a.m. That's the most prevalent time and not very common in the, the midday or afternoon hours in the summer at all. Now, it's a little different story, though, when you start getting closer to the areas that have terrain, like La Crosse. And here in La Crosse area, you still see that morning signal, again, kind of that 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. or 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, in this time frame. But you definitely see more of a seasonal bias in, in our area. And that's because, of course, the La Crosse Airport, where these weather observations are taken, is in a in a valley and it's also near a large river uh, so that's a little different than places like mason city or rochester minnesota that are in more open terrain a little higher uh, elevation things like that so our valley fog season certainly in the lacrosse area runs from typically late summer into the fall months and you really see that in this signal here um, you know we're talking end of july through august into maybe the first parts of october but we see quite a few occurrences, given the right weather conditions, of course, of valley fog. And then uh, to switch things up, Boscoville, Wisconsin, which is down in the southwest part of the state, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is, is a huge fog. Now, again, they're in, uh, in a, a valley located along the Wisconsin River Bank, uh, not too far from it. And you really see the not only a seasonal factor here with Boscoville, but uh, a lot longer of a night, you know, uh, a lot more hours of fog, I should say. So it, it's very common in the warmer season, especially in a place like Boscoville, Wisconsin, for that weather equipment to report fog. Uh, it's just a, it almost always fogs in there if the winds are at all light. So that's a little bit of the climatology. Uh, you might be thinking, okay, so how do, how do forecasters predict fog? And I will say as, as someone that does forecast from time to time, it is a challenge. Uh, there are certain challenges in our, our business, like trying to predict exactly how much snow will fall, how much rain will fall. But I think in, in some of our areas, trying to predict uh, when it will turn foggy and how dense the fog will get is certainly a, a challenge. Now, we have gone, we uh, have several staff members that have uh, done research, uh, especially for the La Crosse area here, where we have a lot of valley fog. Uh, things like looking at wind direction, wind speeds, uh, how high up the, the ridge the fog is. And so we have different tools. And, and we're developing, I think, some skill certainly at, at trying to predict uh, when places like the La Crosse Airport and Basketball, the valley locations, are going to see fog. Um, and then, you know, but even with that, you look at a place like La Crosse, uh, where we do aviation forecasting for, it is surrounded by water. You know, here's a look from above at the La Crosse Airport, and you've got the main stem Mississippi River and Lake Onalaska out here. And so it's interesting, you know, even on nights when we really think it, it's going to be a, a fantastic setup for valley fog, uh, a little bit of shift in wind can sometimes blow that fog 
off of the airport or it stays out here over the channel and never really gets to the airport runways themselves. And so it still is a little tricky. Uh, I don't think we ever bet a thousand on that forecast, but uh, again, we, we kind of, we look at the wind speeds and the lower kind of layers of the atmosphere. We look at the moisture and how that, how that leads into the evening and things like that to try to make our determination. And of course, time of year, as we just talked about. All right, so let's keep moving on here and, and talk a little bit more about the dangers of fog and the challenges to different transportation systems and, and of course, safety tips. So when you think about can fog be dangerous? Well, this is a, a screenshot from the movie, The Fog, that I think came out in 1980 or something like that. Um, and, you know, it's not like there's spooky things out there in the fog, but when it comes to transportation, you know, if you're if you're at home and it's a foggy night, nothing's going to happen. But if you have a trip planned, uh, if you're a truck driver, or you know, as we'll talk about with other transportation systems, yes, fog can be dangerous. It can be a tremendous travel impact and and, and cause issues. And so again, that's why um, the, the safety ideas are important with fog. So when you think about marine. Uh, you know, it could be a ship on the Great Lakes or a private boater, anything like that. Uh, dense fog is, is a big issue. There's certainly been, you know, major ship wrecks on the Great Lakes from, from in wind, but also from foggy scenarios. And, you know, you've got lighthouses out there to try to help with that, uh, but certainly impacts marine and boating. Uh, another big transportation sector that's impacted by fog is certainly aviation. You know, it can, it can cancel flights. It could delay flights. Uh, it could cause diversions. Uh, again, that's why we forecast for certain airports so that pilots, if they're either taking off or attempting to land, uh, know what to expect. Uh, is the visibility really going to be that low? Can I still land or is it impossible to land in that scenario? Here's kind of an interesting screenshot taken from a, a Birmingham, England. This is a, kind of showing you uh, when an airport ends up getting fogged in at the last second. How you've got these planes, uh, these different lines on here are routes the plane has taken, and, and basically a foggy scenario. These planes come in and they're kind of circling until conditions improve. So that, you know, it's not only maybe dangerous, but it does cost the, the aviation industry a lot of money. That extra fuel, and of course, it's not good for commerce. It delays uh, people from landing and, and so on. And then if you go back through the history books again lots of significant airline accidents caused by fog. And so it, it becomes very dangerous, of course, to the aviation industry. Uh, and then more recent to Kobe Bryant's. Um, the, the helicopter he was on in, in Southern California, uh, as word has it, you know, the pilot had to divert because of fog or was worried about fog and being able to see and maybe got confused in the fog uh, it kind of is a disorientating type of effect on pilots and uh, ends up crashing into a hillside. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be history a long time ago, of course. And then, of course, you have the, the, the driving um, road conditions. And, you know, whether it be a, a two car crash, a single car crash into uh, something in the road or some of these large pileups that are, you know, excessively dangerous. Uh, fog accidents are, are a huge factor. You can see this this photo on the right here of a, uh, a big pileup, and you can still see the fog in the background that probably led to it. Uh, but we're going to show you some local examples here in a second and, and talk a little bit on, on safety on these. So when I was looking, trying to look up some statistics from the U.S. Department of Transportation or the Federal Highway Administration, um, you know, some of the things that they talk about here. You know, the impact to roadways with fog, certainly the visibility and the distance that you can see and, and the visibility distance is a, is a huge factor. Uh, how it affects traffic flow, of course, speed uh, and, and maybe people, you know, going too fast. Uh, the variance in speed. Some people might sl have slowed down and others might still be going full speed. Certainly uh, time delays because people are typically driving slower or you might have to. And that accident risk that we'll talk about. And then, of course, you get to the specific driver. Um, you have to deal with the variety of capabilities and behavior of drivers. Do they take the threat seriously or do they just keep going at full speed? Uh, are road treatments needed? Is the fog freezing on the roads, for example? Um, access control, which is defined as intersections or driveways. And then 
you know, things like speed limit controls. Are people using cruise control and they maybe shouldn't in those examples? So I, I found a few traffic studies online and it's kind of interesting to go through the, the stats, but you know, a lot of the summaries talk about that uh, most drivers try to stay within vision of a car in front of them. That they, they feel like they're safer if they can watch the car in front of them, I guess. And what ends up happening a lot of times is they end up following at, a, at an unsafe distance because of that. And it's, we're especially talking dense fog, you know, where it's really thick. Um, sometimes driver, drivers try to keep their speed up and they try to stay in certain uh, in a lane. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes that can lead to more problems. Uh, they see reflective markings on the side of the road and it gives them more confidence. So they end up uh, driving too fast. And, and even sometimes when people reduce their speeds, they're, they're still oftentimes going way too fast. So some of these studies, uh, here's one taken from 1990 to through 2012. Again, most of this is from the, the National Highway Traffic, uh, Traffic Safety Administration. Um, and the blue line here for accidents where it's just fog, uh, you can see there has been a downward trend in that, which is good. But we're still seeing, you know, a, a fairly uh, high number of fatalities. So the overall studies, and I've got a couple other graphs here. You know, it talks about the age. Uh, I guess younger drivers maybe a little more uh, possibly p potential to have a fatal fog-related crash. And then when you get the pileups or the number of vehicles involved. Uh, that really increases the, the fatality rates. But most fatalities occur, if you kind of sum everything up, in the colder seasons, which is what we've looked at as fog may be more prevalent during the early morning hours, uh, typical in rural areas, uh, non-divided highways, so that would be your two-lane roads or, or those kind of conditions, uh, younger drivers again, and from those large pileups we talked about. So that's kind of a good way just to summarize it up. Looking back at some more of their data, just based on region of the country, right in the middle of this graph here is our region or the Northern Midwest. And um, you know, the, the Northern Midwest here is one of the, uh, the leading, I guess, number of crashes related to fog. And I was able to break down the numbers by state. And so again, these were fog only reported accidents from 1990 to 2012 in the in the three state area here wisconsin minnesota and iowa so it you know it, you can see a little bit more uh, higher numbers in wisconsin perhaps because of the great lakes uh, i know there's been a lot of pileups in the eastern part of the state uh, but we've had our our share of instances even locally here and then um, more likely maybe radiation and infection fog in in the other uh, states in the area here so it's interesting, in my particular service area, La Crosse office here, uh, we have 28 total counties that cover parts of Southeast Minnesota, Northeast Iowa, and Central and Western Wisconsin. Uh, fog is actually one of the leading fatality producers, believe it or not. It's, I believe it's third or fourth on our list. Uh, you've got floods, you've got heat, uh, and then you start looking at things like fog, believe it or not, uh, more so than, than tornadoes. And so these are some of the more recent cases where we've had uh, fatalities in our particular area from fog-related instances. And if you look at the cause, which is the column on the right, you start to see some common threads here. Uh, when trying to cross a road, uh, you know, you have those unfortunate head-on collisions, but the, the more recent three all failed to stop at intersections, most likely because they couldn't see the intersection or, or you know, couldn't see the, um, the signage there maybe weren't familiar with where they were at. So we do have a few examples from, again, our particular service area. Here was a case uh, up near Owen, Wisconsin in, in Clark County, uh, where again, dense fog led to some um, serious accidents. Here's one from uh, Western Wisconsin, Monroe County uh, last year. Again, this was a failed to stop at an intersection. And more recently in Northeast Iowa, this past spring, again, a case where it, failed to stop at an intersection, I believe, uh, Highway 52 and Highways 13 in, in Northeast Iowa, and, um, you know, again, some serious accidents there. Now, what we try to do at the National Weather Service, of course, is alert people when we, A, expect fog, or B, when, you know, when we see it occurring and, and realize it's going to become dense. Uh, we do have an advisory called a dense fog advisory, 
And this is the number of dense fog advisories issued by each National Weather Service area, if you will, uh, in about the last 10 years, from 2010 through 2020. And uh, again, the La Crosse National Weather Service is kind of right here where Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa meet up. Uh, but you can kind of look around the country, pretty pop or, or much more frequent along the Gulf Coast. Um, and then it kind of varies from different parts of the country, but it, it somewhat matches our climatology uh, graphics that we looked at as well. Um, then another, another graphic here that I was able to find it, it, uh, from the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, where they looked at vision hazards and fatal motor vehicle crashes. And uh, again, the different colored shades would be the the frequency of instances in, in their particular National Weather Service area, but the black dots are representing locations where fog was a contributor to a fatality, uh, you know, based on an accident. And so again, you can see our area of the country, it, this, this is something to, you know, certainly watch out for in, in cases of thick fog. Uh, it's not just a, a rare occurrence. It, it, it happens quite often, and that's the seriousness of it. And this is just kind of a look at uh, especially the bottom graphic here is kind of showing you the different times of years uh, going back to 2005 when we've issued uh, dense fog advisories. And again, a little more common in the fall months and maybe into the late winter versus the middle of summer. Like I said, what we try to do is put a dense fog advisories out. We'll have information on our websites. We try to put out a variety of different you know, safety graphics, uh, you know, try to, to get that word out. But I think detecting the fog and making sure people know that uh, certain areas are going to be more foggier than not, you know, hopefully people make some sound decisions, especially when it comes to travel. So as we kind of finish up then when it comes to safety ideas, uh, this is kind of a collection of different things that have kind of picked up through the years or research, but obviously slowing down. You'll have more time to react. Uh, be as alert as you can. Obviously, people still want or need to travel in fog, but um, you should be extra alert. Increase your distance between vehicles. Obviously, have your lights on. Uh, make sure you have the low beams, of course. But these days, with automated lights in a lot of cars and people just leaving it on auto, uh, there's cases where it could be foggy out and still bright enough that your, your headlights never come on. So something to think about manually turning those on. Uh, again, be ready for emergency stops. That comes into the being alert. And the idea of driving in a pocket. In other words, try to position yourself uh, around enough cars that you're kind of in that safe zone and not too close to the people around you. Some final ideas here. Um, obviously, turning off cruise control. We kind of talked about that. But um, use the right edge of the road. You know, we talked a little bit about the reflective markings, uh, but that's safer to kind of veer more to the right than then hug that middle line where you could end up uh, with a head-on collision kind of scenario. Uh, signal early and try to avoid sudden braking. So again, it's that altering your speed uh, uh, excessively fast can cause problems for, for people around you. From what I picked up in our area especially, I like this statement, be especially cautious near intersections, driveways, and when crossing traffic. I would say almost all of our cases we hear about involve these scenarios. So I really try to push this when I'm working a fog um, event out of our office. Uh, be careful near intersections, driveways. Uh, again, crossing traffic might have the right of way. They might be going full speed. No one's seeing each other with the dense fog around and uh, it could be a, a real issue. Uh, and if you do stop, make sure you get out of the flow of traffic. Uh, and kind of related to that is if you are unfortunately ever involved in a, a uh, uh, one of these pileups, whether it be from fog or uh, winter driving and you're caught in one of these pileups, realize that the pileup might continue. In other words, the whole pile of cars might move. More vehicles might come into the pile. So, you know, you're, you're really safer trying to get up on the side of the ditch or get clear enough away from that accident scene, if you can, safely, of course, uh, so that you are not in the impact area of that. All right, that is all um, I have on the uh, on my scheduled presentation here. So um, I see there is a few 
questions or comments here in the uh, the window, so I'm going to see if I can answer those for you. Um, it says the first one is does dew form under similar conditions as fog? I'm a nature photographer and love both dew and fog. So uh, that's a that's a very interesting and tough one to answer, but it, it does oftentimes form in the same condition. You're talking about enough low level moisture uh in in those cool nights to get to get dew on there so i i think when it comes to forecasting it it's tough sometimes to know if if it's going to turn to fog or if it's just going to going to kind of be dew on the blades of grass or nearby vegetation and i think it it kind of comes down to how how good is the fog setup if it's just kind of a a so-so or medium setup it might just cause dew on everything uh, but if it's really looking like it's going to fog in, then, uh, you know, you're still going to have some dew around, but it's not going to be as sunny, I guess, uh, from that. Uh, let's see, someone had passed on, you know, don't ride others' tailgates to the fog. Yep, yep, good point. Uh, you know, that gets down to that. You know, again, people have tendency to try to keep with the car in front of them, I think, because they can then they can watch what the car in front of them does. But oftentimes you're you're putting yourself at way too close of risk. And um, another question here, uh, getting back to valley fog, what's the typical, uh, let's see, I, I can't read the whole thing. Uh, uh, what's the typical, if there is such a thing, temperature difference between the valley and the bluff tops? Is it that the valley temperatures just drop that much closer to the dew point or, or, or more so than along the bluff tops? Yeah, yeah, John, you're, you're right onto it there. It's the cooler air. Um, hitting those dew points earlier in the valleys and the dew point and temperature are kind of a way that you can you know estimate your relative humidity when the temperature is cooled to the dew point and the dew point is kind of a, a value of how much moisture is in the air let's say uh, when that when they're the same that's a hundred percent humidity and that's where we get our fog so you're right as, as the temperatures cool they just uh, they'll cool down to the dew point quicker and and in those scenarios, the, the temperature difference between the valley and, and ridge tops or bluffs, boy, it can be, uh, I've seen, you know, anywhere from, you know, maybe on the average five to eight degrees, but I've seen extremes where it can get 10, 15 degrees. Sometimes the coldest of still winter nights with deep snow on the ground, uh, it'll actually be much warmer on the bluff tops than down in the valley locations. And in parts of our area too, we have, what we call bogs or the cranberry areas where that are very low uh, and that cold air just naturally sinks into those. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon in the middle of summer for them to dip into the 30s uh, just because that's a, it doesn't always form fog, but the cold air is sinking into those areas and really focusing. Uh, and that, a lot of times that does lead to valley fog. All right. Again, I appreciate you attending here tonight. Uh, that's about all of the slide material I have. Uh, I'll stick around here. If you have any more questions, feel free to answer them in the question box uh, through the GoTo, uh, GoToWebinar interface there. And, if, and certainly if you have other topics for future presentations, you can email them uh, to us or, or, or yeah, to the office or to me. My email address is todd.shea. That's shea at noaa.gov. And uh, we'll try to get it on the list. But again, I appreciate you taking the time to, to sit in on such a lovely evening outside. So stay safe.